Reviewing the return on investment from owning a digital cinema camera. Hi, my name's David. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm an independent director of photography. I shoot videos for business and broadcast. That, uh, that means basically I'm a standalone little business and other companies, agencies, television networks will contract to me to shoot a project as opposed to being staff or say on payroll on like a TV series. All of my work is a little like one to four or five day assignments. I wanna back up a little bit and give you a little background on how I ended up owning not one of these cameras, but two. If you go all the way back to 2010, climbing out of the previous recession, I had to pivot the type of work I was doing to continue working. And I fell into a group around in 2010 that was producing a lot of low budget, regionally broadcast TV spots for um, direct response. So essentially infomercials, you know, the, the widgets you see on TV for 1995. I dabbled in that space a little bit in years prior, but uh, had never really focused on it. And 2010, uh, it seemed like everything else had dried up and that gave me an opportunity so I made these contacts to kind of try it out and see how it would go. And in parallel to that, the Canon 5D Mark II came out. And uh, as I'm sure you all know, that uh, was the first DSLR that had a video recording capability. A lot of the ads I would do, they were micro budget and they were a test to see if the product would have any traction. So I'd get a tiny little budget. I'd go out and shoot with myself, solo, director, cameraman, editor, maybe an actor, maybe I was recruiting someone to play hand model or push buttons, but it will be some new widget for 10 or $20. Uh, we'd shoot a quick 30 second spot. They would run that in a few markets for say four days or a week and uh, see what kind of call center volume they'd get for orders. And that would determine whether or not this particular product was viable to scale and market to the next level. So traditionally those were shot on uh, lower cost video cameras and they looked very cheap and low budge because well, they are. Um, so we started shooting those 2010 on the 5D Mark II. This is a Mark IV, but uh, same idea. And uh, this was my package, a 24 to 70 Mark I zoom and the camera body. And uh, that was it, maybe a couple of reflectors or a few lights and it was all voiceover driven. This DSLR experience rapidly scaled to the point where we were shooting long format, 30 minute shows for broadcast with three and four DSLRs. And uh, you know, you'd have like two people at a desk, let's say host format. So you'd have their two close ups, a wide shot, maybe a reverse or a product close up as a fourth camera. And so quickly learned all the challenges and limitations of uh, the DSLRs at that time. Like I think you can only record for like 10 or 12 minutes. The cameras were notorious for overheating, especially outdoors. Uh, the monitoring was difficult, you know, no peaking. You could not magnify while you were rolling. Uh, mini HDMI connector out. This is all stuff I'm sure if, you've, if you found this video, you've already experienced all of those pains. So Canon released the C300 Mark I, which was very obviously targeted at the DSLR video market. You know, I had six success with the 5D. And uh, now you had a proper video camera or digital cinema as they are marketed. I'm kind of cynical on the digital cinema, cinema term because it seems like if the camera is not made for live television, it's now considered digital cinema. Uh, and you dress it up with all your accessories to make it look like a movie camera. And I get it, if you're filmmaking, these tools have viable applications. I mean, that's why I own some of the stuff, map boxes, filtration, follow focus, onboard accessories. And uh, yeah, it's fun to geek out on all of the, the stuff you can put on the camera. But the reality is most of the stuff I shot on the C300 was in this form. Prime lens, EF mounts, hand grip, and uh, my eyesight was better back then. I could actually shoot and get reasonably in focus with the teeny tiny eyepiece on the back of the camera. But overall, the ergonomics of this camera are not something I particularly enjoy. Um, I mean, I get it, like I said, because it was made to mimic, as I understand it, an SLR and make it an easy transition for a SLR shooter. But as someone who started earlier on in the business using television cameras and film cameras, you know, I'm used to the bigger form factor, something that plays nice on your shoulder, has an eyepiece on the side, uh, is weighted or long enough in that the camera body 
counterweights a lens. Now this thing is so short and stout that you end up having it out forward and then you got a lens out here. So all the weights on your forearm. So now you're experimenting with uh, the vest with the cables and I would just much prefer to have that camera on my shoulder and that longer body also is friendlier to just cradle under your arm. My intention with this channel is not to get into the weeds with gear reviews and kits. I want to focus on the business side, the process, the decision making that will allow you to earn a living at this and may have this be your, your occupation. Looking back, I kind of blew it. I should have purchased a C300 immediately when they were available because it seemed like overnight my clients were requesting this camera consistently. I have my red package. I considered that my high-end kit for commercials, higher-end industrials, and then I had some DSLRs to do the low budge or small crew. And the red just wasn't viable for broadcast assignments because they're quick to air. There isn't time or budget to deal with color manipulation, processing raw files. And back then the learning curve just wasn't there in a broadcast environment to someone for someone to work with uh, raw. So I booked a travel job. It's like a documentary marketing film for a health insurance company profiling patients throughout the United States. We do these little like stories, uh, day in the life of someone who's a, a client of this insurance company. And it was budgeted as a DSLR. It's gonna go out there with a 5D and shoot. And then as we got into the creative prior to, in prep, I realized, you know, these are gonna be like 60 to 90 minute long interviews. And then we have to very quickly transition over to B-roll mode and whatever remaining time window we have with that subject is to knock off as much B-roll as we can. And we had specific timelines to accomplish or storylines connected to whatever that person's story was. You know, it was all occupation driven. So I was nervous, this 5D, I had a director who wanted to monitor things. So very nervous getting on an airplane with a bunch of HDMI connectors. Second, the overheating and limited runtime were big concerns. So. The C100 just became available and shipping, and I think it was around $6,500. So I purchased a C100 as an experiment. Like, okay, I'm gonna see if I like this DSLR form factor and a proper video camera. And this job, basically the rental, the DSLR rental rate from the job, I'll use that to help cover my purchase costs on the C100. And then when this project's done two months later, if I don't like it or I want to upgrade to the C300, no problem. I can sell that C100, take the $1,500 or $2,000 resale price hit, but the job that I just did makes up the difference. So essentially I'm even. I'll throw the numbers up on the screen for the C100. I don't remember exactly how long I owned it. It was a few months and uh, that one job essentially made up the bulk of the revenue you see here. And then when I sold it, I think I sold it for two grand less than it cost, maybe plus the additional sales tax. So then I went out and I purchased the C300 Mark I, and this is in EF mounts. And I believe I bought at the same time the 24 to 70 Mark II, which was the current model, a couple of internal batteries and a few cards. And um, the camera price had dropped at that point. I think the MSRP was 14 or $15,000. And then you know, the lens was, I think, 2,200 plus some batteries and cards, uh, 15, 16, 17, yeah, I don't know, maybe 18, $19,000 um, to have a basic package, lens, batteries, media, camera body. Okay, so I'm gonna jump to the hard numbers, the reason you clicked on this video, and I wanna repeat that this camera right here, in my 22 year career, earning a living as a director, director of photography, this is my best return on investment. So month one, and this is my experience with whenever I buy a, a new expensive item, I end up sub renting it several times before I decide to buy it. And then I make the decision, I purchase it because of all the rentals I've done, and then it'll sit for a month, three months, I don't get any calls and I have buyer's remorse. And uh, that kind of happened with this camera, same thing. So first month, $350. And then month two, it picked up a bit, 750 and let me back up so a couple things on the revenue so in most cases i am working on a package rate and it's not a dry rental so i book a job as a director of photography or a camera operator and i'm bringing my own package to the shoot some projects pay like a, a package rate it's one number 
but I try to on my invoices so I can track it, I try to break that down. So let's say like if it was a thousand dollar job, I'd put three fifty or four hundred dollars in there as my camera rental and these numbers reflect that. So in many cases it included a shootable package. So a single lens, tripod, batteries, media, uh, that's all part of this kit. Although I'm only looking at this, you know, as if it were uh, the return on investment on just the, the camera. Month three, the momentum really picked up. And this is also the point in the year for me where production is very seasonal and cyclical and it, it ramped up. So $4,106. And uh, another comment, so these numbers are cash basis, which means this is when I got paid. It's not when I did the, the date that I did the project. And there's this odd thing with receivables. I, I find that checks show up in the mail in batches. So I have some clients that pay right away, others that'll pay in two weeks, some pay net 30, others are contracted for net 30 and it ends up being 65, 60 or even 90 days. And so what I found is I'll do a whole batch of work and none of the checks come in and then they all come in together. A 60 day old check right next to a, a one week old check. Month four, 3,600. Month five was July, no rentals. July, that's just been my experience. I, I don't seem to work. It's summertime, school's out, my clients are taking vacations. And then I learned no reason to sit at home waiting around for a phone that's not going to ring. So we started taking uh, our big family vacation in July as well, which is usually the first two weeks of the month. And then I get back and there's not a whole lot going on. Or I might pick something up in the, the final week of July, but because again, this reporting is cash basis, I'm not going to see the receivable until the following month. That would be month six and that's uh, 1983. And then 4,500. 5,500, 1,050, 6,250, 2,400, and month 12, $3,050. So that brings me uh, first 12 months of ownership revenue generated from my single C300 Mark I, $35,000. Uh, amazing. Now let's look at this from the perspective of when did I break even on that $15,000 purchase. I back up here, it's month seven. Seven months to pay for a fairly expensive camera. So getting out of year one, I don't think it was year two, it may have actually been year three, but shooting a lot of interview projects that are two cameras and I was continuously renting a second camera. And then I was also getting nervous because I was so busy that I, if the camera gets damaged, if I damage the camera on an assignment, I gotta have a backup and I would carry the 5D in the truck and the red package just in case, but it became more and more obvious that uh, I just, I have to have redundancy. So I bought a second C300. I was able at that point to purchase it used. So saved uh, quite a bit there. And the second one I got in PL form because in parallel to all this, I had my red package. And at that point I also owned a, an Amira, my first Amira. So I had several PL lenses primes and zooms. So made sense to just go PL on the second item. And I'm happy I hung on to the original EF because again, this was great for the little solo assignments. Okay, I'm gonna wrap this up with two final points on owning expensive camera equipment. Number one, I don't like to lease or do loans and I don't. I always use cash or uh, actually with this camera, what I did is I purchased it on a credit card and that gave me a 30 day grace period, no interest to figure out how to pay for it. I, I had some money set aside to cover it. And then I also had a big wave of receivables that I knew were going to come in in that 30 day window. And I had this pending project that I was going to get a rental on with the 300. So at that point it just made sense. I'm going to walk in credit card it. I'll pay it off in 30 days. No financing. I don't like leases and financing for gear because, well, one, I just don't, debt, debt stresses me out, and uh, I don't want to be in a position where I'm making a bad business decision, uh, doing a high-risk rental or taking on like a lower budge thing where the gear is going to get a little more beat up because I know I have a lease payment due. Uh, if, if I've used my own cash, it takes that anxiety away from me, and uh, I can kind of I can say no to something if it's outside my comfort zone and I don't have this financial worry that's weighing on my decision making. And second, don't purchase an expensive camera in the hope 
that it's going to introduce you to higher end work or that uh, you're gonna get a bunch of rentals and the rentals will pay for all or part of it. Those are all wonderful side effects, but I don't think that's a safe or there's enough of it out there to ensure that that's going to pay for it. And especially if you may make mistake number one, which was leased it in the hope that you'd find this new business. So that's why I'm always generally a little bit late to the next new product. I prefer to lose a few thousand dollars at the beginning by subrenting the, the new item to figure out if I like it, if I'm comfortable with it, and if it's truly got lasting momentum with my client base before I go out and buy it. That's it for today. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, love to continue the discussion in the comments below, and we'll see you here next week.